Because you know something else I love is Easter. Anybody else with me? Do you love Easter? I know as a pastor, I'm kind of expected to say that I love Easter. It comes with the job. But I've always loved Easter. I mean, I loved Easter when I was a kid, getting to dress up all fancy, winning the egg hunts. I didn't just hunt eggs, but I found the most eggs, if you're with me, all right? Getting a basket full of treats, how cool was it to get up and like on some random Sunday morning, there was all this chocolate and candy in this nice little Easter basket. Got to have lunch with the family. You know, it was rare for my family to gather together and have a meal throughout the year. So it was always a special time. What's not to love about Easter when you're a kid? But I have to tell you, I actually enjoy Easter more as an adult than I ever did as a kid. And that's because I still get to have all the fun that I had, you know, when I was a child at Easter. I still get the chocolates, and I can still decorate eggs if I want to. Listen, if you don't go out there and pet a bunny before you leave this morning, your, your Sunday is not going to be complete. So we still get to have all of the fun of Easter, but as adults, we appreciate the meaning of Easter. It becomes a holiday that isn't just about springtime and cute animals and seasonal chocolates and a lot of fun for the kiddos. No, it becomes a celebration of our Savior who died and rose again. It becomes the party that we throw when we recognize we don't have anything left to fear in life because Jesus has already conquered the enemy and he has already overcome the evil in our world. Easter is an incredible Sunday. Now, many of you, you get it. You're here, you showed up with anticipation. Actually, you came on Good Friday worship night. Man, how amazing was that? This place was packed. And our team led us in an hour of worship to our God on Good Friday. Man, I really believe what happened on Friday is setting the stage for what's happening here this morning. There are so many of you, and you love Easter just as much as I do. But some of you are here, and you don't fully get the hype. You can kind of understand, yeah, I see why people might like Easter a little bit, but I don't know, I haven't really connected with the holiday the way you all seem to have. No matter which of those camps that you fall into this morning, I want to take you back to the original Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And what I want to do this morning is I want to focus on the story of the women who discovered that the tomb of Jesus was empty on that first Easter Sunday. And I believe that their story is actually going to be incredibly helpful for you no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey. Because the story of these women is really the story of people who believed that they had come to a dead end in life. They had come to a point in which they had no hope, they had no options, they had no answers, and they had no clue how to move forward. But they discovered what I hope every single one of you will discover, that when Jesus is involved in this story, hope is always alive. Right. So let's go to Mark chapter number 16. Mark 16, we're going to take this story piece by piece. We'll begin reading here in verse number 1. The scripture says on Saturday evening, so if you're not familiar with the Passion Week, Jesus was arrested on Thursday night. He was put to trial on Friday. He was hung on a cross on Friday afternoon, and then he was buried in a tomb. And the Bible says on Saturday evening, when the Sabbath had ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out, and they purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. Now, Mark's telling of the resurrection, it's a little bit different from the other three gospel writers because his story and his retelling of the resurrection focuses almost exclusively on the female disciples and what the women were doing that Sunday. The other stories tend to focus on the men. And listen, the men kind of get top billing throughout the Gospels, all right? We hear a lot about Peter and Matthew and James and John and Andrew and all of these different guys. But Jesus, during his ministry, he had plenty of female disciples who were very actively involved in his ministry. In fact, the Bible tells us that it was women who primarily funded Jesus' ministry. Did you know that? What's up, sugar mamas? Thank you. First century ladies for doing what to bring it back. Yes. Thank you, ladies, for doing what the men weren't uh, apparently interested in doing back then. 
So the men were often spoken of in the New Testament, but the women were present, the women were active, and they had an incredible part to play. And on Easter Sunday, they take center stage. We read more about the women than we do the men. Why is that? Where were the guys on Sunday morning? Where were Peter and Matthew and James and John? What were they up to? Well, the Bible actually tells us they were weeping and grieving over the death of Jesus. The scripture says, that they were so afraid that the same people that had arrested Jesus and tortured him and then executed him on a cross, they were so afraid that those same people were going to show up and take them into custody and put them to death that they locked themselves inside of a house together. They were petrified and paralyzed, and they were unwilling to, to believe that the story was not yet over. Now, it's pretty easy to kind of judge these guys, you know, to sit back 2,000 years later because we know how the story ends. And so we're like, oh, how could they have been so fearful? The ladies clearly seem to understand something that these men didn't. Although it's easy to judge these guys, their reaction really is understandable. They were desperate and they were disillusioned right? They'd given up their lives to follow Jesus. For the last three years, they had left behind their families. Some of them had very successful businesses, and they had walked away from all of those things so that they could follow Jesus, and they could hear him teach and watch him perform miracles. These men witnessed blind children recovering their sight. They were in the room when demon-possessed people who had been afflicted for their entire lives, were delivered by the words of Jesus. They had seen and experienced some of the greatest moments ever in history. And then, because of all that they had seen, because of all that they had experienced, they became convinced that Jesus was not just some rabbi, but he was actually the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, That he was God incarnate, come to earth in order to reveal himself to the world. They got to see and experience something really incredible. But before they could even make sense out of what was happening, you have to understand the events of Thursday and Friday, they happened so fast. Before they could even make sense out of what was going on, the scripture says that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. He was put on trial. Listen, how many capital trials last for about an hour? But Jesus did. He was found guilty of treason against the Roman Empire, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. And he was put to death. He was executed, crucified between two common criminals. All of their hopes and dreams evaporated in the space of 24 hours. Everything that they thought they knew about who they were and, how, who, and who he was. All of it was gone before their brains even had time to process it. So you can imagine the questions and the sadness that the male disciples must have been feeling. They must have been wondering, were we wrong about Jesus? Or was Jesus wrong about himself? Is that what was going on here? How are we going to go back to our old lives? I don't want to be a tax collector anymore after I've seen people's lives transformed. Who wants to go back to being a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee? I don't, how could I give up what I've experienced for what I used to settle for? And besides, even if we could go back to our old way of life, would the Romans let us? Or are we going to be on the run? Are we going to be dodging the police? For the rest of our lives. Now listen, you've got to understand that the women on Resurrection Sunday had all the same experiences and anxieties that the men did. So their circumstances on that first Sunday were not different. What was different was how the women responded to their circumstances. Now, I just need to say real quick, this isn't like something that's inherent in females and they're just faithful when men are not faithful. That's not it. But the women truly understood something that the male disciples didn't. And that is, when I don't have the answers, I keep moving closer to Jesus. When I don't have the answers, I keep moving closer to Jesus. Why? Because that's where answers are found. 
That's where the miracles occur, in the presence of Jesus. Wherever it is that he's at, that's where I want to be when life seems to be going off the rails. The miracle wasn't going to happen in the upper room. The miracle was going to happen at the tomb. And if they wanted to experience the miracle, then they needed to get their tail ends to the tomb in order to see it. The women understood this even while the men were cowering in fear, unaware that the story was still being written. But these women, they seem to be committed to honoring Jesus and seeking his presence even with all of their questions and their fear. Oh, do you catch this? There is something that is revealed about the truth and the maturity of your faith when you still seek the presence of God despite all of your questions and your fears. When life is not going the way that you expect it to, if you are still pursuing Jesus, if you are still trying to get in his presence, because that's where you know the answers are going to be found, that's where the miracles are going to be had, that reveals something. So these women were demonstrating a maturity of faith that even the male disciples, some of his inner circle, simply did not have. They got answers that other people didn't. They experienced miracles that others missed out on. Now, we expect about 400 people or so to make their uh, Easter, to be here at our Easter celebration this Sunday, which is awesome. That's so good. Can I tell you that of the 400 or so people that we think will be here through two services this morning, there will be about 400 or so people that are facing difficult circumstances in life. Unexpected hardship. I don't know what it is that you might be going through, but I know there is something in front of you. And you're saying, well, this isn't what I was expecting. I didn't think my life or my circumstances were going to work out this way. It might be a health diagnosis. It could be a struggling marriage. You might be facing an empty bank account or a relational break. It might be wounds from your past or anxieties about your future. And listen, you are probably going to be tempted to just freeze right where you're at this morning. To to grieve over what you think you've lost and to assume that your story is over. That it hasn't worked out the way that you thought it would, and you just need to accept it. But listen, the story wasn't over for these women on Sunday. The story was still going on. They were going to discover that God was still writing this amazing story. They were still involved, and Jesus' death was not the end. And if Jesus' death was not the end for us, I want you to understand that you're not facing the end of your story either. That God still has a good plan for you. Good Friday will give way to Resurrection Sunday. You have not hit the end. God still knows you. He loves you. And he has a plan that he is working out. I just imagine too many of us looking at our life circumstances and saying, well, my hopes are dead. My dreams are dead. My relationships feel dead. And God is saying, yeah, they might seem that way on Saturday, but Sunday's coming. There is a resurrection that is happening. Dead things coming back to life in the name of our God. So when I don't have the answers, I'm going to keep moving towards Jesus because that's where hope is found, because that's where answers are going to be had, and that's where miracles occur. So as the women are moving towards Jesus, they're headed towards the tomb, they realize They've got another problem that they have not considered up to this point. We read in verse number three, on the way, the women were asking each other, wait a sec, who's going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? But the Bible says, as they arrived, they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. You know, Jesus wasn't buried underground the way that we bury people today. In the first century, what they did was they would carve caves into rocky hills and cliff sides, and they would place a body inside of there. And then they would take a large circular stone, and they would roll it in front of the opening of the tomb. And these stones were absolutely massive. They were designed so that nothing could get out and nothing could get in. The whole job was to protect the body. In fact, archaeologists tell us that these stones, they would... They would weigh anywhere from one to two tons. So between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds. On the way to the tomb, these women are like, uh, did anybody think about that 4,000 pound stone? What are we going to do about that? 
how are we going to handle that? It didn't really matter that, like, Salome had been going to CrossFit for the last six months. <laughs> she had, like, she had doubled her deadlift. I mean, she had gotten some strong quads during that time. didn't matter. They were literally facing an immovable object. There was no way that they were going to get that stone away from the entrance of the tomb. So what do you think the, the women did? Do you think they turned around? They went and tried to flip the spices on Kijiji and maybe recoup some of their money? No, the Bible says that even when they didn't have the answers, they kept moving towards Jesus. They kept trying to get into his presence. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know this. If it's going to work out, it's going to work out when I'm near him. So they head towards the tomb. And the Bible says as they arrive at the tomb, they discover the thing that they had been stressed out about this whole journey there had already been dealt with for them. Here's what the women learned and what I hope you'll learn from their story as well. There is no need to stress out over things God has already worked out. There is no need to stress out over things that God has already worked out. Can I tell you that most of the things that you and I end up worrying about day to day, they never come to pass. Those are actually just the whispers of the enemy who's trying to paralyze us, who's trying to, 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 who's trying to keep us from moving forward into the destiny that God has for us as his children. That many of the things that we find ourselves so consumed with and concerned over, God has already figured out how that stone is going to be moved away in your life. The women didn't need to waste a single moment worrying about how that stone was going to get away from the entrance of the tomb. God already had that worked out, okay? They didn't have to worry about any of it. In fact, there were some other uh, barriers and obstacles that were in front of the women that they didn't even realize. So as they're walking along and they're worried about this stone, they didn't even know or didn't even consider the fact that although there was this, in addition to this giant stone that was being uh, placed in front of the tomb, the Bible tells us that Pontius Pilate, the governor of the region, had put a seal on that tomb. And that meant that it would have been illegal in order to open the tomb. Now, the seal was just wax, like any, anybody could have broken that, even the women, but it would have been a crime. And would have made them even more fugitives than they already were. And because the Romans were concerned that the disciples might show up and try to steal Jesus' body, the, the scripture says that they actually put a detachment of soldiers guarding the tomb. So these women had all sorts of obstacles in front of them, some of which they were aware of, some of which they had no clue about. But God had already worked out every single one of them. The stone was going to be rolled away. The seal was going to be broken. The soldiers had already abandoned their post. The women didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. They didn't need the answers. They just needed to show up where Jesus was and see the power of God on display. There is no need to stress out over the things that God has already worked out. How much time and energy do you think you might be wasting with anxiety over things that God already has worked out? He's already got your situation handled. Listen, God knows when your healing is going to come. He's already identified the person that you're going to marry. You walk around every day just so consumed, like, who's it going to be? Is it him? Is it them? Well, ah, what do I do? And God's like, I've already got that worked out. He knows exactly when your house is going to sell. You're praying every day. You're checking the listings. You're like, you're calling the realtor. Did we get an offer? I promise you, God already has that lined out. God knows when your promotion is coming at work. Listen, the heavenly father has already scheduled the reunion between you and your earthly father. I don't know what it is that you are worried about, stressing about, freaking out over today. But there is no need to stress out over things that God has already worked out. And you say, well, Dan, I mean, look, of course God's going to move the stone for these women because it's kind of important to the story. But how do I know that God already has my circumstances worked out? How do I know if he's already got it worked out or not? Listen, inherent in that question is the belief or the fear that there are some things that are not under God's control. <laughs> See, if you say, I don't know if God's got my situation worked out, what you're really saying is, I don't know if God's in control. But God is sovereign over every single thing that happens on this earth, including your circumstances. If there is anything that God is not in control of, then he's not God. 
inherent in the definition is having all power, all knowledge over every single situation that you are facing. Jesus, when he was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he told his hearers, listen, God is actively caring for every flower of the field and every bird in the sky. If God has those sorts of details all worked out, I promise you he's got you covered as well. So don't stress out over things that God has already worked out. All right, let's finish the passage here. Mark chapter number 16, we'll read verses 5 and 7. The scripture says, when they, the women, entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. (laughs) That's probably an understatement right there, isn't it? They came to anoint the body of Jesus. They expected to find a dead guy there, but he was gone. And then there was this alive person that wasn't Jesus. It turns out he was an angel, and he's saying, hey, guys, don't be afraid. (laughs) It's funny, the the standard greeting from every angel in the Bible (laughs) is don't be afraid. Man, at Good Friday, I was praying for this guy, and boy, he's facing a, a difficult health diagnosis, and he asked me to pray for him. And I said, hey, the, the word, the phrase that God just keeps bringing to my mind is, do not fear, because that is the, it's the thing that's said again and again here in the resurrection story. It's what the angel said to the women when they walked into the tomb. It's what Jesus says to the male disciples whenever he finds and catches, they catch up with him a little bit later. Do not be afraid. Now, listen. Do not be afraid only makes sense in circumstances and situations in which there is something to be afraid of. Are you with me? Yeah. That, that, that commandment or that encouragement, it makes no sense when life is easy and you have all the answers and everything seems to be humming along quite nicely. So the angel looks at the women and says, hey, you have every reason to freak out right now, but don't be afraid. Why? Because you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Oh, they weren't looking for answers. They weren't looking for a new path forward. They weren't looking for wealth. They weren't looking for a husband. They showed up at the tomb, and the thing they were seeking was Jesus. And he says, you're here seeking Jesus, but he is not here. He is risen from the dead. Don't believe me? Look where they laid his body. Now, go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Oh, man, this is so good. I love how this story kind of wraps up, or this part of the story anyway. They get there. The tomb is empty. They see an angel, and the angel says, hey, this is what's coming next. Go grab the men, those scared, cowering guys. Go round them up. And then I want you guys to go to the town of Galilee. Jesus is already there waiting for you. You're going to go back to where it all started, the place where you guys met Jesus, the place where he first introduced himself to you. He's going to take you back to that point, not to bring you back to the start of the story, but instead to begin a brand new story in you and through you. Early on in Mark chapter number 16, The the scripture seems to be emphasizing that like no matter what the disciples thought, Friday was not the end of the story. We get towards the end of Mark chapter number 16, and it's almost like God is trying to encourage them and us to remember Sunday is not the end of the story either. Do you realize that? Easter is an incredible uh, celebration. It's a wonderful time to worship and to honor the Savior who, who rose from the dead. But listen to me now. God's plans for these women and these men didn't end on Friday, and they didn't end on Sunday. After Sunday, there was going to be a Monday, and there was going to be a Tuesday, and then a Wednesday. Eventually, a full week was going to go by, and then some months And some years, it turns out that there was an entire lifetime and more that was still in front of every single one of these disciples. God's plans did not end at Easter. In fact, you could argue that Easter began the start of a new plan or the start of a new chapter for the entire church and the rest of the world. After Good Friday came Resurrection Sunday. But then just not too long in the future, we had Pentecost. 
And then we read about the Council of Jerusalem and then Paul's missionary journeys. And eventually we get to the Reformation in Europe and we fast forward far enough in time and we get to the, the planting, the starting of Connect Church and the salvation of our souls. The story of God is still being written. Friday was not the end. But Sunday is not the end either. God has good plans for his people. And they include every single one of us. So the invitation then is to keep following him no matter what obstacles life throws at you. When things go off the rail, when you don't understand why your dreams and, and, and God's calling even in your life hasn't turned out the way that you thought that it would, the invitation is keep following. Keep trying to get closer to Jesus. There are answers. There are miracles to be had. There is a new path forward, but you won't find it if you're hiding out, if you're grieving and lamenting all the things that you think you should have had in life and you don't rather seek Jesus. Pursue him. The closer you get to him, the more quickly you'll discover that he still has good plans for every single one of us. Now, buried in this passage, in this last little section of verses, is the most incredible little detail. And I can't finish today's sermon without pointing it out to you. Did you notice in verse number seven, and in fact, we'll put this on the screen just to highlight it for you here. Did you notice in verse number seven that the angel told the women, go and gather the other disciples, including Peter, including Peter. Now, why did he need to single out Peter? I mean, Peter was obviously one of the 12 disciples. When he said, go get the other disciples, Peter should have just been included by default, right? I mean, Peter was the leader of all the disciples. So, of course, if they went and gathered the rest of the male disciples, they would have found Peter and brought him along. But if you know the entirety of the story, you know that this instruction needed to be included. See, on the night that Jesus was arrested, he's having dinner with his uh, disciples and He's gathered them together in a room, and he says, tonight, one of you guys is going to betray me. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and I'm going to be put to death. Peter stands up, and he says, Jesus, I will never let that happen to you. Jesus says, okay, buddy. Um, <laughs> before the night is over, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, absolutely not. If every one of these other jokers around the table were to walk away from you, you can trust Jesus. Believe this. I will never abandon you. Jesus says, okay, buddy, okay. So they go out. They pray in the garden. The soldiers show up, and they arrest Jesus. Peter remembers his promise. The Bible says he pulls a sword from his belt and he tries to chop off the head of one of the soldiers, but he's a fisherman. He's not a warrior, so he misses the guy's head. He accidentally slices his ear. Jesus actually heals the ear of the man who put him in handcuffs and led him to jail. And Peter is like, oh my gosh, they've got my Lord. So he's following, but he's kind of scared, you know? So he's following at a distance, and they take Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane, and they bring him to the jail cell for holding, and Jesus is following. And while Jesus, I mean, Peter's following, and while Jesus is in the uh, jail cell, Peter's outside, and he's keeping an eye on things. What are they doing to him? What's going on? I'm going to be close so that if he needs me, I'll whip out my sword again, and we can, we can do this thing. They take him from there, and they bring him to Pontius Pilate's house. And they bring him to a couple other buildings throughout Jerusalem, and the entire time the scripture says that Peter is following at a distance. But later that night, he's confronted, not once, not twice, but three separate times, including by a little girl. And there are these people that say, hey, 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 you have a Galilean accent. And you kind of look like one of those guys that was with Jesus, that guy that had just been arrested. He's probably going to die. You were with him, weren't you? And three times Peter says, nope, not me. I don't have a clue who this Jesus guy is. You have me confused with somebody else. I have one of those faces, and so, no, it wasn't me. Three times, the Bible says, he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. After that third time, Scripture says a rooster crows, and he's flooded with the memory of Jesus saying, hey, before the night is up, you're going to deny me three times. And in bitterness, the Scripture says he weeps, and he runs away. Can I tell you a really hard truth about Peter? 
there is no evidence that Peter actually showed up at the crucifixion on Friday. There are several disciples that are name-checked in the gospel while Jesus hung on a cross. Most of them were women, but anyway. Peter's name is never mentioned. In fact, from the point that Peter denies Jesus until the angel says, go get the disciples, including Peter, we don't have a clue what this guy is up to. So listen, yes, the angel needed to say, including Peter. Not because the women wouldn't have thought that he belonged at this meeting in Galilee, but by this point, Peter must have been totally convinced that he would not belong at this meeting in Galilee. He's like, no, I'm the guy who denied Jesus. I had my chance, and I blew it. Actually, I had three chances, and I blew every single one of them. So maybe y'all should go on and meet Jesus, but I don't deserve to be there. And the angel says, nope. Your story didn't end on Saturday, Peter. Your story is still continuing. God still has good plans for you. Listen, Easter, the resurrection story, the good news of Jesus Christ is for all people, including the Marys and the Peters, the ones who got it right and the ones who got it wrong. The ones who were trying to get close to Jesus and the ones who were running as far away as they possibly could. How many of you guys are glad to know that you are included in the good news of the resurrection story? You might as well scratch out Peter's name and write the name Daniel there. The, the, the resurrection is good news and it includes Daniel and Amber and Shanna and Ryan and Tanya and Max, and every single person, we are all included, even if we're more like Peter than we are Mary, even if we're more, listen, the death and the resurrection of Jesus not only covered the women who were so full of faith and doing all the right things, it covered the men who were so scared and doing all the wrong things, it covered the soldiers that beat Jesus, it covered the thieves who mocked him, it covered The trailer park kid from Texas who didn't think there was a God, but eventually discovered that the good news of Jesus includes all of us, even Daniel. Ah, Easter really is the best Sunday, the best day you could ever imagine because it includes every single one of us. If you think about it, You know, a lot of holidays that we have, they carry around a lot of, like, exclusion and stress. There's some of you guys that love Valentine's Day, and some of you are like, well, this ain't a holiday for me because I'm single. Or, you know, you got Halloween, and you're like, well, that's for kids and people who like candy or dressing up. That ain't me, right? We've got got, um, political holidays. We've got all these different. Easter is for everyone because the gospel includes absolutely everyone. So earlier I told you that the men and women, they were all facing the same circumstances on Easter Sunday. The only difference was in how they responded to the good news about Jesus. So the question now becomes, how will you respond to the good news of Jesus? When you hear, hey, this story includes you, you're not at the end, you're just at the beginning. If you would move closer to God, if you would give him your heart in the same way that these women did, you would discover that he has a brand new story that he wants to write in you, through you. We we jump down to the end of Mark chapter number 16. In verse 15, Jesus has now met the disciples, male and female. He's met them all in the town of Galilee. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news. To who? To the people that are full of faith. Nope. To the ones who dress up nice and show up to church on Sunday. Nope. To the ones who've got it all together. Nope. To the ones who never got divorced. Nope. To the ones who never denied Christ. Nope. To the ones whose mind always seems to be healthy and in a good place. Nope. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Jesus' promise here is that anyone who believes will be saved. But listen, anyone who refused to believe, they'll be condemned. 
See, there is this good news. There is this thing that has happened in which Jesus on the cross, he took all of our sins, all of my mistakes, all the wrongdoing that I've ever done against people on earth and I've ever done against God in heaven. And he took all of that sin on himself. And in his death, he did away with it. He removed it in the same way that the angels moved the stone. Now I don't have to worry about it anymore. This is good news for all of us, including me and you. The question is, how are we going to respond? Will we accept the invitation to be included? Or will we say, no, this is nonsense. This isn't for me. Yes, it is.